My name's Mike, I'm the pastor at Watch It Breakfast Church. You're watching WBC Online, and you're joining us for the third in our four-part series, looking at some of the women that Matthew talks about in Matthew 1, as he introduces us to the backstory of the family of Jesus. That lineage, that line of Jesus' descendants, finishes with Joseph, who married Mary, who was the mother of Jesus. But we're not quite at that point yet. That's for next time. This time, we're a little bit earlier in the sequence. We're going to be reading from Matthew 1, as we have before, but also from 2 Samuel chapter 11. Let's pray before we do that. Jesus, give us ears to hear. We want to know about this family of yours and what we learn about how they struggled. Help us to be empathetic, to put ourselves in the shoes of those who led to you and point us to you. Amen. So each time we've started with Matthew 1, uh, verse 1, and then skipped to the point in that chapter that refers to our uh, person of the day, woman of the day. And uh, we're going to do that this time as well. We're going to be jumping straight to verse 6. So eyes down. Let's hear about it. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Abraham. And Jesse, the father of King David, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. And straight on to 2 Samuel 11. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman washing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. And then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants, and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were, and when the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. This is a really sad story. And it's sad in much more ways than our first uh, and immediately obvious. So in this story, we learn about a man called Uriah and his wife, Bathsheba, who was very beautiful. And from earlier on, we know that Bathsheba was the mother of Solomon, who was king after David. What's really apparent in this story is that in order for David to become the father of Solomon, he first of all exercises his power to make others do things he wants them to do, whether they would choose it or not. David is, for very understandable reasons, um, sort of lauded, he's, he's put up on a pedestal as this man that was probably closer to God than anybody else ever was. 
lots no a few people in the old testament particularly have this sort of distinguished status but there was i'm going to get the name wrong here i think it was enoch in genesis who walked with god until he was 500 and then he was no more because god took him to be with him then you have someone like elijah who was carried away by a chariot and then you have someone like david and you also have a moses and you know that there are yeah four or five maybe who have this slightly exalted position among the people of god david is one of them despite the way he behaves here and in other places too but particularly in this instance david who isn't out on campaign with his army discovers a beautiful woman and decides he just wants to have her so he orders her to come to him and she does because he's the king and then he speaks with her because he wants to because he's the king and then when it looks like it's going to backfire on him he tries to cover his tracks he orders uriah home so that uriah can sleep with his wife and there will be it'll be won't be obvious that it's not uriah's baby but uriah is too honorable too faithful and doesn't go home to sleep with his wife and when it turns out that david isn't going to be able to cover his tracks he covers them a different way he has uriah killed now this would be rubbish with any soldier in the army of the king for the king to order his murder but elsewhere in the old testament we learn that uriah is one of a group of about 35 really famous warriors so famous they refer to as the 30 that's they had a collective name the 30. there were more than 30 of them but never mind that uriah had a particular place in david's military machine he was one that others looked up to he was the one who carried out david's wishes and yet when push came to shove david was willing to have him murdered so that he could take his wife and cover his tracks not only that but bathsheba wasn't just anybody bathsheba's uh, father was called eliam and eliam's father was called i'm going to check the name here ahithophel ahithophel i've probably said it wrong but that was his name and he was a significant strategic advisor to david so uriah has a military position in david's government and bathsheba's grandfather has an advisory strategic advisory position too just to expand on the story slightly sometime later david's son absalom will launch a rebellion and there will be a civil war between david and his son absalom over who gets to be king and control the country along the way absalom has murdered his half-brother because his half-brother raped absalom's sister and while david is said to have been really upset he doesn't punish his son the rapist so absalom feels that he needs to and when absalom raises his revolt against his father who failed to carry out justice it's ahithophel who becomes his main strategic advisor ahithophel jumps ship from david and joins absalom then it isn't unreasonable to think that that may well be because ahithophel knew all about what had actually happened with uriah and could see david's failure too in the middle of all this we have Bathsheba her grandfather ends up supporting Absalom's vengeance against David so her grandfather ends up lining up against her husband not only that but this baby who has been conceived as a result of David demanding that Bathsheba comes to him dies in infancy she loses her first son she has her husband murdered and she will have i'm sure understood how that happened and why it happened she was after all the one who was pregnant so she's kind of a daughter of tragedy she is one who's been pushed around uses a pawn 
in other people's lives. Her beauty hasn't been a blessing, it's been a curse. She's left heartbroken, even as she eventually becomes not only wife to a king, but mother to a king as well. In this instance, in this moment of her life, she has to deal in quick succession with losing a husband and losing a son. We don't really hear much about that. We hear how David responds to the loss of this child, but not so much about Bathsheba. She's famous, but in so many ways we know so little about her. She's remembered but forgotten. So, why does Matthew include her? Well, perhaps again, as we see uh, with earlier women in Matthew's um, genealogy, part of what he's getting at is, here is someone downtrodden. Here is someone forgotten. Here is someone who's being pushed around. We know that Jesus was keen to support those who sought to be faithful, but weren't recognised. They were pushed to the edges and pushed around by others. We've talked more than once about this thing that Jesus, the problem Jesus had with Pharisees, with those who represented the established church and how they behaved, partly in maintaining the structure that they had influence in, partly by the way they treated those who didn't match up to their expectations. And maybe what Matthew wants to remind us is that Jesus is really keen to stand with those who are pushed around, who are manipulated by others, who are told where they have to be, what they have to do, and left to suffer the consequences, even if none of them were of their own making. As Jesus goes about his ministry, it's not just prostitutes he talks to, it's other outsiders too. He's willing to go and meet with lepers, even though no one else can touch them. He's willing to talk to those who aren't interested in him and heal them. He's willing to accept that he will do good and those who benefit from it won't acknowledge him. He's willing to stand alongside those who have sided with the enemy. This is not what Bathsheba has done, but when you look at how Jesus engages with people through Matthew's Gospel, goodness me, he's, he's so focused and driven and passionate about those who aren't on the inside. He loves those who are suffering and struggling, and he wants them to know that the Father sees them and remembers them and will care for them and longs to bring them home. So, Bathsheba was an Israelite and a pawn and a heartbroken woman and a mother. And in all those ways, all those ways and in others, she becomes chosen by God to be part of Jesus' heritage. And in such a way, as Matthew wants, those Gentiles who read his gospel, those Jews who are finding out about Jesus from him, he wants them all to see that Bathsheba's story is a story that includes and involves Jesus. So what does this mean for us? So what? Well, perhaps we need to look carefully at Bathsheba. Look at how she was treated and make sure that those who are pushed around, manipulated, palmed off, forgotten, that they don't get unnoticed by us. Maybe you think this is very similar to the message from the previous two. Maybe that's Matthew's point. All three of the women, all four of the women that we've looked at so far, Tamar, Ruth, Rahab and Bathsheba, they all have a way of representing people that mattered to Jesus and should matter to us. So at the risk of just being repetitive, maybe the thing for us to take away from this is that we need to keep our eyes open to those who don't fit in the people of God as 
we typically experience it. Let's pray and then let's ask some questions. Lord, open our eyes wide. Help us see people how you see them. Help us to be compassionate and wise and to put our energy where you see it is needed with the people you want us to care for. Amen. Question one. For a while, Bathsheba was a widow before she remarried and David was her husband. In James, we are reminded that true religion is caring for widows and orphans. So here's the heartbeat of the question. Do you know any widows and orphans? Do you know single mothers? Do you know refugees? Do you know, do you know those who struggle to read and write and so they don't find it easy to be part of our culture? Do you know those who are forgotten, downtrodden, ignored? If you don't, how can you go and find some and get to know them? If you do, how are they learning about who Jesus is and what part do you have to play in that? Question two. Bathsheba was heartbroken. It doesn't say so in the text, but it would be ridiculous for us to think that she felt anything else. The loss of her husband and her son. Who do you know who's heartbroken? How are you caring for them like Jesus would? And very often as Christians, we're tempted to try and fix things. Sometimes that's not what's needed. Bathsheba, most of all, needed to be noticed. It made to feel that she mattered more than just for her beauty. How are you helping the heartbroken to know that they are noticed and that they matter? Question three, who are you praying for who is on the margins? It would be great if the person you're praying for, the people, are actually in your community. It's going to be important that we pray for those uh, supported by overseas mission organisations, such as BMS and others. But just now, who are you praying for in your community, in our community, who is heartbroken? That's it for me this time. Next time round will be our fourth and final part of this series, and we'll be looking at Mary. Until then, take care. God bless. I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.